but we should probably start by saying um <laughs> it's been a while <laughs> uh, because <laughs> it has it's been a, it's been a little while since we did uh, an episode of the podcast um a few things came up and we uh we ended up uh having to postpone a couple of episodes but we are back now yeah we better late than never we i think we skipped one because it was slow news and now we've have a <laughs> racked up a whole list of of news items such that once we you get into the quite... habit of skipping though it's easy to continue <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> that's like we were on a, we were on a skipping streak there <laughs> <laughs> and and also i mean I, I think it's probably worth just briefly saying that at the i think after our last recording um we both agreed that we would reduce the frequency of the podcast a little bit from every two weeks um and we didn't intend it to be this long between episodes <laughs> <laughs> but um but we may we may switch to a, maybe a every three weeks or even every four weeks occasionally uh, schedule but certainly more frequent than it has been over the last couple of months yeah definitely so we should probably start with um our plans around swift 6 um we just finished processing all of the swift 5.10 uh builds and so we're fully up to date with the release version of 5.10 which came out a few weeks ago I, I forget exactly when but it was a few weeks ago and the next version of swift will be swift 6 um and we actually have some quite big plans for swift 6 um so as well as as you know our, our kind of standard um routine for a new version of swift is that some point during the beta cycle we will update the system so that it can accept packages with the next version of swift and uh then as we get towards the final release of it then we upgrade the systems to um to fully support the release version and process all of the builds at that point um and we're going to do something a little bit different this one because Swift 6 is a is a obviously a major version release which is always a big event um and there are some breaking changes coming in Swift 6 which you've probably heard about already um they're all around uh structured con concurrency and strict concurrency and you can actually switch on all the warnings around that you will that will become errors in Swift 6 you can switch them all on now in Swift 5.10 and and how do you do that exactly dave would you would you tell us <laughs> <laughs> you use you use one of two flags uh and i <laughs> one of them is uh, enable experimental feature and one of them is a enable upcoming feature and if you get them wrong as i did um <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it appears one of like them your entire will, project one is of them will you make you happy and the other one will make you sad <laughs> <laughs> well the one that made me happy was was it that it showed me that there was nothing to do <laughs> um yeah what sven is referring to there is that i did try and switch this feature on and i got it wrong uh, and if you want the full story behind that it's on the the apology for my mistake is on the latest um ios dev weekly uh introduction so <laughs> you can go and read it there <laughs> um but yes we can we can as of swift 5.10 we can get a preview of all these uh uh what will become errors um and what we want to do is track the compatibility of packages over the Swift 6 beta period. Um, so we actually, uh, was it the end of last week, kicked off our very first Swift 6 preview build, which is not, it's not in beta yet. This is a, a nightly uh, build of the uh, tool chain. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, well, I think I think it actually just finished processing, right, Sven? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it finished earlier this morning. And this is not the, the whole compatibility matrix because Right now, the nightlies have um, trouble building with Xcode build. So it's currently only testing the Swift PM platforms, which is macOS and Linux. By Swift PM platforms, I mean builds that you run with Swift build. And that obviously doesn't work for iOS and builds and the like. So it's, it's a slice of what we'll eventually build. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and we got the results in, and what we're tracking really is the um, error counts. So there's a um, instrumentation in the tool chains where the compiler spits out lots of um, diagnostics, and one of them is the number of Swift 6 errors that it counted when it did the compile. And what we're also planning to do is um, host a page on Swift Package Index which shows 
compatibility of Swift 6 over time. Now that page is not going to be released immediately, partly because it doesn't exist yet, but partly because what we want to do by the time we launch that page is have some data to show, hopefully, the number of Swift 6 errors reducing already. And then throughout the beta period of Swift 6, um, we will maintain that page and keep it updated with how all the package ecosystem is doing uh, with Swift 6 compatibility. Yeah. Yeah, and the idea there overall is to to sort of help a bit with the transition, um, just following people on social media, there's there's a lot of concern that this, you know, the five six transition might be kind of similar to the two three uh, Swift two to three transition in the past, which I don't even recall. I don't think I was using Swift at the time in a an actual product because the stuff we were working on uh, didn't didn't really lend itself to be, uh, you know, uh, at the adoption at that time. So I, I wasn't really one of those people who I guess were burned by that transition. And, but, but that's still lingers, right? That, that pain is still there yeah. in people's memory. I did have code that was affected by that transition. And while my code was not terribly painful to convert, it was certainly, it, it's that thing where if you, if you present the world in a certain way and then suddenly present the world in a different way, people are just going to get upset. And and I remember the mm. uh, the the wailing and gnashing of teeth at the time. And and I think uh, I think it's it's uh, everything we can do to prevent that kind of situation. To just talk about it as much as we can before it happens is going to make the process smoother. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it, it bears you know stressing that there's no reason to believe it'll be like that because. And for a number of reasons. So first off, there'll be, there continue to be a Swift 5 mode. So even if you use the Swift 6 compiler on a module by module basis, you will be able to just compile your code in Swift 5 mode and nothing will change. So you you are not forced to do any of the things that are good ideas to, th to do in general when, when Swift 6 comes around. You know, it has benefits doing these things, but you're not forced to. You, you don't have to do that immediately. And you don't have to do it for the whole project at the same time. So you can pick your battles, pull the things ahead, um, you know, pick pick the ones that you want to tackle first, get get a feel for what it means, um, do it. And then, you know, by the end, over potentially a long period of time, you'll be able to, to transition over. Um, and also there's going to be like a host of resources to help you. I think a lot of these things are going to be quite um, mechanical just by following people exploring what it means. Um, even if you have a large error count, often it's just a few root sources that need changing that'll make that number dwindle like massively by just making a couple of tweaks. Yeah. Um, so when I did find out how to switch it on properly, um, we had around 500 and something errors. But as I, I took a quick look through our... Uh, our kind of list of of, uh, of warnings in Swift Swift five point ten, and there were so many that would that looked like the same thing. Like once we fix one thing, I think you know it'll get rid of a hundred errors, and once we fix another thing, it'll get rid of another hundred. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It looked looked like there were lots of common uh, root yeah. causes. Yeah, it's actually interesting. I believe you mentioned um, there are around the current our dependency injection structure. Is, is that some of them? Yeah, are. yeah. Which is actually interesting because this is something I wanted to update. Um, I have been wanting to update for quite a while. So this is based on a um, quite, yeah, well, I wouldn't say old in the sense that it's outdated, but it's been a few years that we started adopting this or this was published by Point Free Co. That's a sort of a mechanism to do a dependency injection. Um, and it's valid. It works really well. It has allowed us to write tests that are, would otherwise have been really difficult to write. They have, however, so are there, there are some downsides to this mechanism, and that's mainly around composing it between different packages and, and so on. Um, Point Free Co. have a new mechanism, a superseding mechanism um, with their dependency package that you can use instead of this, has the same features, allows easier composition. And I've always wanted to actually make a switch over because it's the better, the more modern system. But, you know, we have a working system you have no real reason to change. So I haven't done it. This is actually an opportunity to do both at the same time. You know, 
get rid of that um, uh, debt. Um, and I have sort of a, a bigger reason to do it at the same time. I actually quite like that. So I'm not aware of the new the new system that they've come up with, but um, I just hope it's as easy as this one because I really like the the way that 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 works at the moment. It is it is simple to for a method that you need to uh, kind of stub out for testing. Um, it's a really easy way to do that. Yeah, it'll be similarly easy. I mean, it's it's really just using macros um, to facilitate the same thing, really. Oh, macros. Okay. I think it's based on macros. Yeah, it's it's like it's like the environment system in Swift UI, in that you mm -hmm. sort of import them. You import um, customization points via a add dependency clause. Um, you have sort of a variable that points to this dependency, which you can then. It's automatically populated with a default, and in tests you can override those, and you don't have any of these typical downsides of a dependency injection system in that you have initializers that need to populate all these things, you know, for your types, because you, you attach it to the types, so to speak. Right. Um, not Sorry, I said macros, I meant property wrappers. That's what. Ah, okay. That, that makes more sense, yeah. But all all of that is that's kind of quite deep in the weeds of, of <laughs> I think we've we've fallen down a couple of rabbit holes there. Um I mean I think I think we'll we'll talk about Swift Six more as time goes on and we'll probably talk about our progress in fixing these 500 and something warnings that we've got uh in in subsequent editions of the uh, podcast because uh, it is something that's going to be a common theme over this summer. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, I think that was it for Swift 6, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Cool. I have a couple of points that I wanted to bring up. Um, blog posts and social media posts that I found really interesting that I've sort of accumulated over the last, um, well, few weeks <laughs> that we've been on hiatus. And the first one is a blog post by Daniel Kennett, a great blog post called Combining Swift and C Sharp on Windows with Swift to CLR. I I don't recall where I saw this. I believe it might have been on the Swift forums that he posted this, um, this article. He did, yeah. yeah great. Um, it's really well written. I, I just read it again because this is from February, um, I think, early February. So it's been a while. Um, and I reread it and I've liked it all over again. <laughs> it's really worth a read. Even if you, like me, aren't deep into ABIs, runtimes, and C++ translation layers, but he just paints a really nice picture of, of this proof of concept job that he started over the Christmas break. Um, you were just speaking about rabbit holes. I think um, Daniel was quite deep in one there and tells a really <laughs> a nice story about it. Um, the story about building a three layer contraption to bridge C sharp to Swift. <laughs> right. And and not only that, he has somehow managed to create a helpful image of these layers, like an actual image with um, source code and IDEs and stuff showing how they interact. It's it's really well done. That's great. And I, I read it too and I, I did think it was uh it, it was interesting. It's it's also more low level than I like to go normally as well. And what's really nice is, so he sets out this goal where you think, oh, wow, is he going to, to manage that? Or is that going to be a blog post about the, you know, aspirational? <laughs> but he actually succeeds. So he, he lays out nicely at the start what he's trying to do. And he, he manages it in the end, which is to build both a Swift UI and a C Sharp Windows app that sort of inf interfaces with a common backend that is written in, in Swift and sort of is targeted by both these front ends as the instrumentation to to what the backend does. And the backend is a camera um, API. So to manage um, camera feeds and, and that sort of thing. Which is, just to give some context to that, that's what uh, Daniel's apps do. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, and he even not only did, did he write this post and, you know, talk about his his journey, he even managed to generalize everything into a tool that does the automation of generating these translation layers. So it's not just all, you know, hand assembled stuff that sort of manages or works to, together somehow, but he actually manages to, to productize it in a sense uh, so that a lot of the mechanics of it are hidden away and done by a tool, which is really promising. Um, and yeah, I mean, one thing I'd like to add, um, 
we've sort of seen some really interesting posts appear on Swift.org recently around Swift as a language appearing in outside the, the typical habitat. And I think that would be a would have been a post that would have been really nice to see on Swift.org itself. Um, maybe it's not too late. Maybe that could still happen. But um, I think that would be worthwhile having and giving it um, you know, another boost or more reach in general. I might bring that up at the Swift website workgroup meeting, actually, because I think you're right. I think that would, I think it would be a good choice. Cool. Um, another bit of news, uh, since we're talking about Swift on Windows, I saw that the other day, Helge Hess posted that he managed to get Swift running on ARM Windows 11 via VMware's, uh, VMware's Fusion on Apple Silicon. And I found that really interesting because when I initially considered, you know, I think, was thinking about how to get started with Swift on Windows, you know, just to get a feel for how it works, um, I always run into, well, I don't even have a Windows machine and, you know, I have I have an old Intel Mac around, I think, but sort of my initial take would be, my, my first step would be to, to spin up a VM, but then you immediately run into the architecture problem, you know, ARM, Windows, and and um, Swift probably not working on it. And so I found that really interesting to see that it actually can be done. And Helge said it's, it's not all that involved, so I actually might give that a spin. Um, I doubt we'll do our compatibility testing on Windows on ARM, but it certainly would help to get a feel for how it how it could be set up if um, if it was possible to do that locally on a VM uh, just on my machine. So I found that really interesting to see. Yeah, I think it does bring up the 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 there's a little bit there's a small a baby elephant in the room, which is we have Linux uh, compatibility testing, but Linux is a is a many faceted <laughs> beast and there are many different linuxes and uh we don't we're not we're we are very uh unspecific about what type of linux we are testing on um and um and so as we come to think about windows compatibility and swift that's one of those as well where it's like well there's windows compatibility and then there's windows compatibility yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and i also i don't <laughs> think we'll do arm 64 on windows mainly because arm 64 windows has had a bit of a rocky um start i think um and and i think it's the vast vast majority of windows is still uh intel x86 uh windows that's not to say that there's no arm 64 windows out there but i think it's not it's not on the verge of becoming dominant or anything like that yeah definitely and it certainly is unlikely to be the cheapest way of actually you know hosting those builders right yeah um so I, I think going with Intel will be the, the wise choice there. While we're on the subject of Windows compatibility, um, or, or sorry, Windows uh, and Swift, um, there's a blog post, another blog post from uh, Jeremy Day from the browser company who have been working on um, uh, their Arc browser for Windows. And in fact, the, their Arc browser now is out in Windows and that is a Swift application. Uh, and this blog post is called Swift Tooling Windows Edition. And he, in it, he talks about debugging, he talks about how he edits code and lots of stuff. And there's, it's quite a, an extensive uh, blog post, but definitely uh, worth a read on this subject. Yeah, I think I saw that as well. That's really nice. I just love seeing um, Swift pop up in all these different places now. It's, it seems to be hap happening more frequently, or is it just my imagination? Um, I think it does, yeah. I think I think certainly um, the work that the browser company have been doing has um, generated genuine interest in Swift on Windows. I think that's been really instrumental um, in what we've been seeing, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll include links to all of those articles in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. And just to you know, wrap this up, the news section. Um, and I think you've you had this in iOS Dev Weekly as well, didn't you? The um, Playdate blog post on Swift.org. I did. Yeah. Yeah. This is a blog post about uh, you know running in the theme of Swift in unusual places, writing Playdate games in Swift and Playdate is a well how would you describe Playdate? A Playdate is a is a handheld um gaming um console, I guess. Um 
which is it has a a, a little cortex chip in it and uh, it has a one bit so black and white only um uh screen uh, in it which is quite high resolution but obviously just a monochromatic uh, display um and it is made by panic uh, who make uh, things like Transmit, which is the, the FTP and SFTP client, and uh, Nova, the text editor, uh, which is really good. Um, and in fact, they've, they've made so many apps over the years. They've, they're they cornerstone of uh, independent Mac development. Um, and they, a few years ago, decided to... Uh, I think the original story is, if I remember rightly, I may be getting this wrong, but the original story, if I remember rightly, is that they wanted to make a... Um, kind of long service gift for some of their employees that had been there a very long time, mm. and they they thought about making a little a little because they they actually do publish some games as well. They publish several uh, games on Steam and on various different platforms, um, and I think they they want the, the initial idea was this that it started uh, as one of those, and um, then they decided to do a kind of public release of it and uh they hit that public release right during uh or, or the kind of development of it right during uh covid and also the chip uh shortage <laughs> so i think it's had uh in fact i know it's had quite a a difficult um journey to being released um actually just i, I won't go any further into the story but if you're interested in the story behind playdate um the panic podcast which is a not a regular podcast but they did a series of i think six or seven uh podcasts and a couple of them at least were on the history and the development of playdate and they are a fantastic uh listen i really thoroughly enjoyed them um so that's what the playdate is um and they have an SDK so that anybody can write uh, software or games for the platform. Uh, they also have a little app store. Uh, so if you do write a game, you can publish it to the app store. Um, and uh, I think their primary language for games is either C, and they have a C SDK, or Lua, mm -hmm. which is a commonly used in gaming scripting language. Um, but... Uh, now that they can add one more language to that SDK, <laughs> yeah, and that is Swift, and that's that's going via the uh, C API. And I think what's um, worth calling out here is this is using the fairly new embedded language mode of Swift, um, which is sort of made for these devices with you know more more constrained environments. Um, and what it does, it spits out smaller binaries by you know stripping and and all sorts of techniques like that. I think it has no or very tiny runtime and it's a language subset, so it doesn't have all the features of full-blown Swift. In particular, there's no Objective-C interop, there's no reflection, um, and there are no there are some limitations around Unicode. So I think the, the main thing is that it doesn't have the um, Unicode data tables, which means like Unicode point stuff, you know, like character width and traversing strings isn't isn't available by default. You need to opt in, and then then that pulls in that those data sets, making the binary larger. Um, I think they're they have more uh, constraints, but th those are just the three that I found in in quickly par um, looking through the description of that language language mode. Um, and you would need to use a nightly toolchain to actually uh, make use of that and, and build and target the play date with Swift. Um, but it's really great to see that this is being being used and uh, opens up Swift to uh, yet another place. Yep, fantastic to see it. And um, I think as as Swift six uh, arrives, um, I hope we'll see some Swift uh, games on the play date store. Yeah. I think that's probably about it for um, news um, and kind of catching up. So why don't we do some package recommendations? Let's do some packages. Do you want to kick us off? Sure thing. Um, the first um, package I want to talk about this week is called Threadcrumb uh, by Alexander Cohen. And uh, the description of it is a Swift, uh, sorry, Swift no-nonsense dependency-free breadcrumb logger. Um, and I really like the idea of this. It's it's probably uh, something that that you can already do if you have all of your symbolication set up in your in your project, so that you can get fully symbolicated crash reports whenever you want them. But 
I really like the technique that, that Alexander's using here, which is to, you get the API to, 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 to the developer, to you, um, as threadcrumb.log, and you can put a string in uh, a log message and, and, and as you're logging. Um, but the way that these log messages appear is, uh, I think, quite clever. What it actually does is it insert, inserts stack frames into the backtrace with the log messages in the method names of the uh, the stack frames. So you can get these log messages out regardless of symbolication. Okay. Um, and I thought that was a really clever little uh, a clever little idea. Interesting. Okay. So so even if something's messed up, you could still see enough in the stack trace to, to sort of piece together where where things were at. Yeah. And and there's a good uh, screenshot on the um, uh, on the uh, readme file that uh, uh, that you you can if you check it out on the Swift package index that you can see uh, how it kind of manifests itself in in a real world environment. Um, <laughs> actually, there's an interesting story behind that screenshot. <laughs> I was going to um, ask. <laughs> <laughs> so so. This screenshot up until I think yesterday, um, well, actually overnight last night, it, it fixed itself. Um, but up until yesterday, this screenshot, if you'd have checked the screenshot out on the Swift package index, uh, it would have been a broken image um, because we had a situation with some readme file screenshots um, that were not making it through to the package index. And it's a fix that, that we deployed to the system uh, yesterday um, which was, so there's several ways to include an image in a GitHub readme file. Um, some of them you can just refer to a file, like if you if you include the file in your repository, sometimes people put a, you know, dot readme images directory in, their, in the root of their repository or something like that. Um, and then just reference that file on raw.github.com, whatever it is, um, that will work just fine. And whenever we pull the, uh, read me in from GitHub's API. Those images load just load off GitHub servers. But some of the images, depending on how you upload them to GitHub, um, when we request the README file via their API, they come back with a JWT attached, and that JWT has an expiration date of five minutes. So as we ingest the README file into our system, and we hold a cache of that ingested readme file. So we, we upload that to um, S3. That cached readme file has an image in it with, an, with a JWT on it, which has expired. And so those images are never going to display for us because it's unlikely that you would ever look at a readme file within five minutes of us caching it. <laughs> um, so that has been a little project that I've been working on the last um, week or so, which is to, as we ingest the README files now, we also look through for any of these images that have uh, JWTs attached, and we cache those to S3 as well. So uh, the good news is you should now no longer see any um, broken images on any of the README files in the package index. Um, and it wasn't, this wasn't affecting a huge number of uh, packages. It was... 611 images across 148 repositories. So as a percentage of our total, it was fairly minor, but where people have included an image in their readme file, it's usually quite an important part mm. of what the package does. And so I'm really glad that we were able to get it fixed. Yeah, that's that's really great to, to have in. So yeah, that's um, Threadcrumb by Alexander Cohen. And uh, yeah, go check out the uh, the the shiny new image on the readme file <laughs> nice right my first pick is called flying fox by simon witty um flying fox is a lightweight http server with async await apis um, and i came across that recently because i needed to write a a small proxy and i I th normally would have reached for Python, I think, because, you know, it has stuff like that built in. But I I have been moving more and more of my scripting jobs over to Swift lately, and, and I really like it. So I looked around when I needed to write this little proxy, and I recall that I had looked for HTTP servers a while back, and I came across Flying Fox again. And um, 
and tried it and it did it perfectly. It's really concise, a really nice API, really easy to integrate and write that that, um, that proxy. Um, mm -hmm. Why I really like Swift over Python in situations like this is obviously the type safety, which helps you write it, but I found that it's it's much easier to pick up projects with large time gaps in between because the type safety helps you under helps you understand what you were doing at the time. You know, like these little scripts, I don't write lots of comments and stuff. They're off the cuff written things that you write in the moment when you know what's going on. And when you re revisit those sort of things is when you lack all the context. And I, I feel Swift really adds a lot of context out of the box because you are sort of putting it in the types that makes it really nice to work in these projects. And that's why I really like it. Right. Um, so the thing explains itself via the documented types rather than having to guess, ask, guess at what it is from the outside. And in Python, you always have this thing, you know, I guess it's a dictionary. Yeah. But you know, how deep is it? What, what's in it? You know, that's, that's always kind of, kind of weird. So yeah, that's, that's a really nice aspect. I'm sort of <laughs> digressing a bit from, from this uh, nice package. Um, I mean, I wouldn't really say much about that. I, I, I digress into a bug fix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and while I'm while I am I'm doing this, I might as well mention the the one downside I found when writing scripts and wanting to use um, dependencies like here. You know, I want to use Flying Fox in a script. Um, obviously, to try it out, I can't I can't not mention our feature on the package index. Try in a package where you can click a button and get a ready made playground to actually use the package. Which is nice to try it out, but if you actually want to run the script, that's not really, you know, the way you would want to be doing it. So then you hit the problem of how would you use a dependency in a script, and um, you're kind of either forced to create a package, which is not too hard, but it's also kind of tedious. And the other thing you can do is um, use the package Swift SH um, by Max Howell. Um, Swift SH is a package where you can write scripts and pull in dependencies via comments on your import line and then it under the hood it does all the package creation executable target definition for you so you can use the dependency in a script as if it was um, a package and and that's really nice so um long story short if you need to write if you need to do anything with an http server you know, imagine you have a you're writing an app and you want to stand up a very simple API to play around with it. That would be a really nice use case for something like Flying Fox, where you can spin up a server and you know easily instrument it on a fake backend, that sort of thing. And and these are the tools you could use and uh, to help you with that sort of problem. Um, yeah, again, Flying Fox by Simon Witty. It couldn't be any simpler either. I'm looking at the readme file right now, and and to start up the server is literally two lines of code: uh, instantiate a, 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 a HTTP server and call the start method on it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's what I really liked it, and it was one of the few ones that I looked at that had like modern async await um, interface, uh, which made it mm -hmm. just appealing. My next package is. Um, a package for testing and it's called expect to eventually equal <laughs> which 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 is what caught my eye um uh in kind of browsing through the packages uh, that were new to the uh, index uh, it is a fairly new package only been in development for a couple of months um and it's by john reed <clears throat> who is a uh, kind of cornerstone of um, testing knowledge in the Swift community. He, he's been mm. writing about testing in, in Swift for many, many years now. Um, and so um, this, I mean, it's, it's going to be no surprise what this does, is it adds uh, an additional assertion where you can um, specify a block to execute and an expected value for that block at some point in the future. <laughs> um, and what it does is it calls that block many times um, with a timeout of one second. Uh, I presume the timeout is probably uh, customizable, although I don't actually see a method to customize it in the readme. So maybe it's not. Um, and um, it will continually repeat the call to that um, block until the value 
is as expected mm-hmm. or the timeout of one seconds is here and it's it's quite clear in, it, when it does fail um okay I'll, I'll read you out one of the the kind of failure messages here it says expected to but was one after 93 tries timing out after one second um so it's, it gives you a really nice reason that the assertion failed if it failed or if it passed within that second then you just get a test pass which is great nice yeah i mean there's the whole expectation thing right that comes with xc tests but it it can be sometimes a bit awkward to set up you know you have to you know, put the fulfill things somewhere and a block based interface is just nicer for for some apis yeah in, and that's in, why i that's why i liked it because you look at this code sample here and it's just it is so simple to do um tests that 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 may not be the correct value immediately yeah yeah ergonomics in tests i find really important because it's it anything that distracts you from writing tests is sort of it's, yeah it's it's bad you know because you you really want to be encouraged to write as many you know variants and different tests and and, and that sort of thing so it should be as easy as possible really and the other thing that I liked about this is that quite often when you look at, well, or it's not when you look at packages, actually, it's when you think about making a package, you maybe think, well, if I'm going to write a package that's around test assertions, then maybe I need to re- rewrite all the test assertions mm. so that people can use all my test yeah, assertions. Yeah. I really like that this is just, it's just one thing. It's just like, this is a, this is a, uh, a, a better way to do this kind of testing. It's just one assertion. This package is probably kind of done. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it it's it, it may never get another update, it, it, and and nor nor would it necessarily need one unless that something changed under in the underlying uh, code. Um, so um, yeah, I really like that these kind of focused small packages. I think they're great. Yeah, you you said something there that just reminded me. Um, either quick or nimble I'm, I, never, I always confuse which one does which one of them has alternative um, assert um, syntax nimble yeah, yeah nimble is the matcher yeah. which makes it really nice I really like the package I even used it a bit, a bit at the start but the, the problem is not for every project are you going to pull in a test dependency like that um, you know and then when you do, you're sort of faced with that conundrum. Well, do I now switch everything over or just the new tests? And then I have a mix and it's all weird. And yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, we, we also have different, we use different patterns in our tests. And that sort of annoys me sometimes that they aren't all the same, but you know, it's, there's only so much you can do. But if it's something as fundamental, how you assert, it's, it's really tough. I think it's a tough sell then to, to do one or the other. Yeah, yeah. One of the the slight odd ones out is our um, use of uh, snapshot testing. That's a different, a whole different mechanism to um, to, to writing a test uh, than than the regular assertions. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't want to get rid of that. But uh, it is it is one of those things where you have to kind of oh uh, we're doing this kind of testing. Okay, we're using this API. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Although in in its defense, at least it does sort of function, and then it has two expectation values, right? The the nimble one is is different in that in that it's almost like a a statement that you write. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Yes. It, it's it's not like fun- a function call. It's it's, it's different. Um, it's uh, well, it's 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 expect something to equal something. Exactly, um, so it's like a chained um, chained yeah. expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes it a bit stand out it's, a bit more. It's taken from a library which is literally the standard in Ruby development, yeah. which is RSpec. Yeah. So there is an underlying testing library with Ruby, but but almost everybody uses RSpec, and it's a behavioral um, a BDD uh, testing framework where you describe what the thing should do and then you write some expectations in there to um uh, to to uh, assert that it is behaving correctly and that is what quick and nimble are effectively yeah. um porting across to swift yeah i'm really hopeful that with the new swift testing um package that is coming soon or later at some point um that Xcode starts to get better support for different types of testing. Yes. Like I, I, one of the reasons that Quick and Nimble is is challenging to um, adopt is that effectively your entire test suite 
collapses down into one Xcode test. Um, and so you only get kind of one green right. tick oh, okay. in Xcode yeah. because your entire test suite is one test. And then within that test, you've got potentially thousands of expectations or and even um, right, right. You know, sections and everything. Um, and I'm really hopeful that what they're doing with Swift testing leads into um, slightly more flexible reporting of those test results within Xcode. Right. I never actually used, um, which one was it? Quick, right? That's the behavioral part. Yeah, Quick, I've only yeah. used Nimble, the expectations. Yeah. Um, because I really like writing tests. It, it, it's a very nice way to structure your test suite. You can have nice sections. And, you know, one thing that we're also not perfect at, because nobody's perfect at this, I'm pretty sure, is our consistent naming of our test methods um we kind of use underscores to indicate that there's obviously the word test and then maybe the type name and then maybe an underscore in the method name if we're testing a specific method but it's very inconsistent how we name those and one thing that bdd does is it gives you a really nice way to just use english to describe what you're testing and that becomes your effective that's that's effectively your test name right um right so where were we we've, at? we've gone down lots of rabbit holes <laughs> whose turn is <laughs> it is it my turn <laughs> um i think that was mine so i think it's your turn yeah. right my second package and i think probably also my final package right yeah given uh, where we're at in the recording my second package is called Swift Package Info by Felipe Marino. Um, that's an interesting tool. It's a tool that provides info about a package, most notable about its binary size. Um, I sort of think we've talked about this in the past, but I don't think we've had it as a, a package pick yet. Um, if we did, then we just do this whole thing again. <laughs> Um, I saw this again and I thought this would be an interesting metric for us to expose at some point. And we have, so this we have definitely discussed in the past, whether we would have means and ways to expose, you know, binary size on the package page. You know, the interesting part there is, the question is how much will my binary grow if I use this package or a product? You know, that's, it's a bit of a problem if a package has more than one product. Mm -hmm. That's not a one-to-one -one question, but, you know, let's leave those details aside for the moment. Just you know, roughly, what, what would that mean for my you know, app to, to use this package? Um, and the concern has been, well, in order to actually assess that properly, we would have to build that package with a release build. And we're not doing release builds right now because they're much slower than debug builds. And they're not really key to determine compatibility, right? If it's a fair assumption, not a perfect assumption, but a fair assumption if a debug build succeeds, so will the, the release build. Um, again, not certain, but it's a good, it's a good starting assumption. Um, so we're not doing release builds because, you know, we're already on a constrained time budget for our builds and that would just squeeze that further. But I had a thought how we could potentially work with that and get, you know, get to use it at least initially. And that's if we made this an opt-in for packages, because as I just said, it's, so this tool looks at products in a um, package and you have to specify the product if you want to get binary info out of it. Mm -hmm. So we, we would sort of need to have a way for the authors to tell us which product is the one that we should measure. And that would go via our SPI.yaml file, right? That's currently, but that's not just currently, it's probably always going to be the only way for authors to express that um, uh, interest. And that could be a way for us to, to signal to us, right, I actually want to expose this metric, run a release build um, instead of the debug build, maybe in addition, I mean, we'll have to, we would have to deal with the implications, I guess. Um, and authors would then also know, right, we're on a budget. And, and you know, if you already are have a package that's quite large, you, you kind of would know you can't opt in. So that might be a way of, of dealing with that. Um, yeah, and that's why I found this package interesting. It sort of uh, sparked the idea to maybe look at this again. 
It is a very commonly requested feature of Package Index. Um, this has come up several times over the years. Mm. Um, and it always comes down to that release build um, thing. And we always kind of say, okay, well, we'll <laughs> we'll put it to one side. Um, but I remember as soon as we launched the build system back in twenty yeah. uh, end of 2020, um, we, we were instantly asked about this feature. Yeah, yeah. You think it's feasible if we do it this way to to sort of opt it in? Would that still be worthwhile, even even though the opt in is probably isn't going to be huge? But you know, yeah. And I think I think the more I think you're right that this mechanism of having a file in the repository that we read is a good mechanism. I don't I don't want to change anything about that mechanism. Of course, it is always a struggle to get people to um, read anything. <laughs> um, and so communicating that, that this is a thing that we can do is always going to be a difficult, yes, we can do a blog post, but nobody reads blog posts. <laughs> um, yes, we can talk about it on a podcast. And people do listen to podcasts, but they're not at their computer when they listen to podcasts. And so they rarely do, they rarely act. Like it's hard to get people to act. It's hard to get people to do things. Um, because people are busy, and that's not, it's not a criticism of of any uh, of of people. Um, people are busy. There's there's a million things that need your attention whenever you're uh, working, um, and so getting that adoption up will be challenging for it. But as the Swift Package Index grows, and as it becomes um, m- kind of expected for, for a package to be on the Swift Package Index. And, and this is our, our hope, of course, that, that that it becomes the place to look for um, package packages. I, I, um, I think that as we see some packages adopt, some, uh, adopt features like this, we'll see, like it's like we see with documentation, right? Um, hmm. That is a, is a, is a, a process that we're going through to get people to consider hosting their documentation with us and we actually have a we have a one very effective way of letting people know about that which is whenever you add a package we we have an opportunity to tell you um tell people who the package authors about um the features that they can add and that's where we talk about documentation so we could add something there to also say if you'd like to let people know how what kind of size impact um, this is going to have on your uh, on on your users' uh, applications? Uh, we could put that in there. There is <laughs> there is less incentive for them to add this feature than there is about the documentation because if that number is big, <laughs> mm. <laughs> it might stop people using the package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is true. But I think I think uh, I I I think most most packages will not have a significant effect on people's um budget and once it once you reach a tipping point of well why doesn't this package have that number then that becomes much easier you know for people to to kind of uh it's, 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 there's going to be a little bit of peer pressure to adopt these features as as they become more and more used yeah yeah, I mean, I could see this as some SDK having a a good binary size, and and you know going forward and publishing that as a as an advantage, and then sort of you know perhaps generating because it's also not many packages won't need that, right? There's lots of um, dependencies that are sort of used in ways where binary size isn't that important. Like we we adopt packages in our server side project where binary size isn't that crucial i mean we ship this thing in a docker container yeah. <laughs> that, that package dependency is going to make no change whatsoever <laughs> in, the, yeah. in our our final product size <laughs> and there's also examples like like the package we were talking about earlier which is the uh, the testing package expect to eventually yeah, equal exactly yeah. absolutely irrelevant yeah. to uh, to the size yeah yeah here's a thought i had as you were talking about um making people making it easier for people to act I've actually just remembered because I had this thought before. What if we had little actions that, you know, so a button you click that opens up a pull request with a pre-configured SBI.yaml file against your repository. Like for instance, adding documentation, you know, we look at the thing, 
We could even read the package manifest, know what targets there are, generate an SPI.yaml file that's fully configured for the explicit repository, uh, opens a pull request so that they all they have to do is merge it into their repository if if they don't have an SPI.yaml file already. So I've been I've been thinking a little bit around this over the last couple of months as well. Not 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 to the point of of actually doing anything about it, but I do have a half written note about how we might approach it. And one of the things that that I think would, or one of the challenges that we have right now is that telling people, telling package authors, the, the package index at the moment has two groups of people who visit it. There is one who, which is people who are looking for a package, and they're the kind of obvious group. Um, but there is also the group of package authors looking to look at their own packages and figure out what's happening with it or whatever you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And we struggle. Our web pages are very much t- targeted at the first group, um, mm. and the second group they have their own page and it's kind of called information for package maintainers or something like that. And there's a little tiny little link to it halfway down the sidebar on the right hand side of a page. And behind that is a whole load of information about adding badges, about how to configure documentation links to all our uh, kind of documentation resources and things like that on this kind of subject. And that is a less than ideal place to put that um but of course you don't want to overload the site with all that information being pushed down the throat of people who are only there just to find a package um and i think the ultimate answer to this is that at some point we will have a logged in area and that area is entirely for package authors like the whole point of that area is so that you can see that your packages are um producing the compatibility you're expecting that that they are being indexed effectively and showing the information that best highlights what that package does and i don't think a authenticated area of the swift package index is um is necessarily the i don't think the first thing that will come out of that will be for the people who are looking for packages i think it will be for package authors and yeah. this kind of stuff of, of generating an spi yaml file we've got we'd have so much space for all that stuff if there was a way to um uh, let people authenticate and and claim a package and i've been thinking about how we would do the claiming as well and this is now going into like we've this podcast is just full of rabbit holes today <laughs> um but I think we could actually use the SPI YAML yes, file uh, with a token. to, yeah, like with, DNS, to, to kind of say these these are the people who are authorized to maintain this package, and that way you keep that responsibility with the repository of defining the 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 kind of the data for that package, yeah. um, and then if we do a login with GitHub or whatever, that could. It could just be a list of GitHub usernames or whatever it is. I mean, that, it, I haven't I haven't thought this through in that much detail yet. Mm. But I think that's I think that's potentially where we're heading with this kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Um, right. I think that's, that's we a long enough podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so we will be back in um, less time than it took us to get this podcast out. Is is as specific as I'm going to be. Big promises. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but until then, um, we will, well, we'll speak to you whenever that happens. It will probably be in three weeks' time. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.